Great. Great. Let's make a start. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual roundtable um, on scaling during the recession. So I think just to start, we'll do some quick introductions. So um, I'm your moderator for today. I'm Beanal. I'm one of the DG content execs at Cognizant. And yeah, I'm a panelist. Do you want to introduce yourself, John? Should we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is John. I am the VP of UKI at Cognizant. So in short term, uh, I run our commercial team. So I run our account executive function, uh, account management function, and our SDR team. And I'll pass it over to Ashley. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Early. I am the founder and CEO of Other Side of Sales. I'm also a trainer with Winning by Design. And I uh, live, I'm an American by birth, but I live in the Netherlands. And I spend a lot of my time helping startups uh, figure out how to scale, when to scale, and how to do it properly. So really excited for this topic today. This is going to be fun. I guess, Thomas, that leaves you. Oh, is it nowhere near as interesting as these guys, but I'm uh, the enterprise sales manager at Cognizant. So uh, looking after our enterprise function, um, lucky enough to be working under, under John, who is a, a great, great mentor and leader. So uh, yeah, that's, that's me. Amazing. Right, so let's kick off then. Um, question for all of our panelists to start. In the current economic climate, do we think that scaling is even something that sales leaders should be prioritizing right now? Um, should sales leaders be focused on refining their targets instead? You know, if you're likely to speak to middle management right now, they're going to come back and say budgets are frozen or budgets are really tight. Um, what are your thoughts on this, John? Should we maybe start with you? Yeah, I think the main thing around kind of scaling at the moment is really looking at the efficiency of your existing team. Um, and I think that's, I think prior to kind of the meltdown we're seeing at the moment, a lot of businesses were kind of not looking at efficiency, but so much really putting it kind of into headcount. And I think the shift has kind of kind of taken place now where a lot of organizations are looking at the pre-existing team that they got, are they operating to 100% um, and really optimizing the process to make sure that you're getting kind of full maximum output from your existing team. Um, one thing I would note as well is just looking at kind of where if companies are doing well and they've got good market fit and the sales cycles are still going through is potentially looking at like what teams are actually getting the success. Um, I'm quite fortunate in the sense I've got a view of like new business and also RNG, like revenue and growth, uh, retention and growth. Um, and what I'm tending to see at the moment is customers that are very, very happy. Um, we're not really kind of seeing that that budget lock at the moment. If there's proven ROI and there's success there, um, it might be actually diversifying and changing where you're actually putting them dollars in terms of headcount. It might be putting that into SDRs that focus on your existing accounts to kind of cross sell or upsell those existing uh, existing existing accounts that you're working with. So I think there is there is opportunity to scale um, if your team's working at optimal efficiency and you're seeing success and you've got a diversified pipeline, then yeah, absolutely. But my main takeaway is like really look at your teams that you've got and what teams are actually going to get success, mm -hmm. commercial, enterprise, RNG, et cetera. Amazing. Uh, other two panelists, have you got anything to add? Um, you know, maybe we can, do you want to counter or what are you guys, what, what are you thinking? Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'd, I'd want to echo what John's saying because I, I totally understand where he's coming from. Um, I mean, speaking before Cognizant, like even the place I worked at previously, um, using Snowflake as a great example. So um, during the sort of um, COVID uncertainty, they actually did scale. I know obviously everyone uses data. There was a great fit there. You know, no one's going to sort of give up on using data. But the way they did that in particular and the VP that I learned from at Snowflake, um, it was around the target customer base. If you find the ideal fit customer, uh, number one, you're in a great place. But the second piece, as John said, is those customers with um, the higher net dollar retention rate, the happier customers, they tend to don't have that hesitation of spending more because, again, the ROI is proven, like John said. So I think if the process is refined, you can give scale some priority. Um, it, it sounds weird to say scale if you're doing well, but if you've got the process well and obviously your product is doing well in the current climate, then nothing should really hold you back as long as that, you know, that, that additional foundation is already there. Yeah, I, I think you guys are kind of nailing it, but one thing I feel like we need to clarify here is what do we mean by scale? Because everyone always thinks of scale in terms of headcount and hiring people at a, from a headcount perspective hits companies financially differently, depending on 
what country you're in, tax status, reporting, a bunch of different factors, none of which have anything to do with whether or not you've got the process nailed down. So I've worked with companies that literally cannot hire anyone else because the way salary hits the budget, they just can't do it. And I've worked with companies that, you know, kind of throw caution to the wind and will hire anyone and everyone all the time because they can't do, um, it's called CapEx and OpEx. Um, capital expenditure, one-time expenditure, operating expenditure is recurring expenditure. So salary is OpEx, commission is CapEx in most companies. And it, it's a subtle nuance, but you can scale using a lot of different things. You can scale using tools, you know, using a tool like Cognizant to add a new way for your reps to, to reach out. Have to do a subtle plug there. Um, using other tools to increase efficiency of your sales teams. You can do other things to scale without actually adding headcount. And I think, Jonathan, you kind of hit that point where, you know, a year ago, a lot of people were dealing with, oh, yeah, we'll just hire everyone and we'll throw bodies at the problem. Not the first time we've seen this won't be the last. It's just like the ebbs and flows of the markets. Recessions happen. It's not big. It's not scary. It makes things a bit unsteady, but everything will be fine um, in the long term. If you could just take a step back and look at it. And part of one of the ebbs and flows of the economy is people kind of alternating between throw bodies at it and throw efficiency at it. So every company goes through these motions. It's a push pull. It happens all the time. But part of what I think sales leaders need to do is think about what sort of scale is actually needed. How are we defining it? And then, okay, is this really the right way for us to do it? Because to Thomas's point, Snowflake is a great example. They had to scale using bodies because they literally just, they have one of the best tech stacks I've ever seen. They have killer leadership. I love the team over there. They needed bodies because they had a proven system that was ready to go and a target market that was hot to trot. I spent most of my career in sales in, in security which I jokingly say is one of the most recession proof industries because no one's ever not going to buy security because you need that. But even then the way they do it is still that same kind of e efficiency bodies, efficiency bodies. And it goes back and forth. And when a company gets that wrong, that's when you end up with the dreaded layoffs. And it happens. It sucks. It happens. You move on. I'm happy to see a lot of sales leaders getting more understanding of that in the interview process because if you were only at a company for a few months and you got laid off, it is not your fault. You are, do not have a black mark. You're not a job hopper. People know. I was laid off five times in four years. It's fine. People get used to it. And if a company really can't understand that, then you don't want to work there anyway. But like layoffs are more about leadership getting that balance wrong than somebody scaling at the wrong time, I think. So a yeah. couple definitions there. And to agree to that also, what I would say is that a lot of companies who thought they had it right then encountered something like a recession or oh, totally. COVID. And then all of a sudden they didn't think they had it right and they panicked and it was first in, first out. You know, they got rid of so many people. Oh God, I, I, they... I know someone who literally hired, um, who was in the unfortunate position, a sales leader who was given full permission to scale, hired 30 salespeople in fall of 2019 to take the, take the team from like 20 people to 50 80% of them ended up getting laid off in March, April, because there's no way to see COVID coming. That sales leader did everything right. They scaled properly and they got thrown a curveball. Sure. It happens. But again, it's thinking through, okay, what is the right way to scale and how to time it right? And that's, it's hard to do. And it's especially hard when sales leaders are expected to have all the answers and be able to read the global economy and know your ICP. Like sales leaders, like respect, it is a hard job and you're making a lot of assumptions without as much data as generally you want. Um, and we also had to put on these, these airs of understanding everything and knowing what's going on. And you're not allowed to say, I don't know, but this is my best guess. Um, so it's a really tricky position to be in as well as a sales leader to be like, how do I balance all of these things without undermining my own credibility? So it's it's really a balancing act. We'll circle, we'll circle back to this idea of um, for layoffs um, and headcount, um, definitely. I just wanted to, um, this is something I should mention actually at the beginning, if anybody has got any questions, just feel free to drop them um, in the chat and um, we've got someone working backstage who will make sure they get pinned. We have got one question that's just come through from Marek um, on the cross, -sell it, cross and upselling opportunities. Um, so he just wants to know, how do you deal with, those, with these accounts who are also freezing budgets, which affects the products you are selling to them? Um, who would like to answer this question? Let's deep dive into this. I, I'd love to start this one because I've got a really good analogy for this. So anytime, and this stands for the current economy and not, anytime someone is freezing budgets, 
you have to think about that as basically someone in that company. It might be finance. It might be someone outside of your, you know, kind of championship team, but or champions team. But somebody is saying, I don't see this as a major problem. It's telling you that the pain is not properly mapped. It's not properly uncovered. And it's not necessarily big enough. So the way I explain this to a lot of sales reps when I'm training is how many of you have a car? So if you have a car, you know you are at risk of having a flat tire occasionally. That flat tire could be so bad that you have to go buy new tires. Now that said, most people don't have, I don't know, four to 600 pounds, dollars, euros, pick your currency, sitting in their bank account at all times on the off chance they need to, they need to get go get a new set of tires, right? But the moment you actually get that flat tire, you go find the money. You take it from a savings, you take it from somewhere else, you figure it out. So when someone says, oh, budget's frozen, we can't do anything. That means the pain isn't big enough. You don't have that properly. Now you have to dive in and figure out, okay, what's the real implication? What you have to look at more often than not. And shout out to Winning by Design. We do a lot of work with our clients on this, looking for the difference between a critical event and a compelling event. Compelling event, nice to have. This would really help us hit our number next year. Critical event, if we don't get this, we won't hit our number. We're all going to be out of a job. If you have a critical event, you can free up budget. If you have a compelling event, you can't. Now, it's not to say you can always find a critical event, but it's really important to understand that difference. And when you find that, okay, worst case scenario, if they don't get our tool in there, there's going to be some big, nasty consequence. Then it's about just figuring out, okay, who needs to approve this budget? Who needs to unfreeze this? And if the company is really so precarious that they can't free up that budget, then they're not really qualified to buy anyway, because nobody should be buying your product to the detriment of their company. So just think of the tire. Nobody has $600 sitting in their account at all times earmarked for tires, but the moment you need it, they will go find the budget. It's the same thing in sales every day, even in a down economy. John, Tom, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say, like, taking like real life example in terms of kind of what we're seeing at the moment, I think historically, if we look at sales people in general, they necessarily haven't been selling at the power line during the last two years when it's been going through COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably one of the key things now that we tend to see is a lot of these accounts that potentially people are signing have been very single threaded or we're not talking to the ultimate budget holder. Um, and this kind of ties back into kind of the role of leadership and VP, CROs, et cetera, is like now really needs to turn into like a, a team selling event. Um, and when it comes to these um, kind of cross sell, upsell opportunities, like go into those accounts where they're good fit. They might have budgets on hold, but you know that you can add a lot of value and get your CRO, your CRO to reach out to these decision makers parallel level um, to kind of initiate those conversations. And if you like exactly what Ashley said, right, if you can tie it into um, an organizational goal and objective that they're looking to achieve, absolutely they'll unlock some budget. But I think that's kind of the disconnect at the moment I'm tending to see is that a lot of people aren't at that power line. So when it comes to these, these budget freezes, there is no way that they're going to get this budget unlocked because they're not dealing with the person that's actually calling the shots. Um, so yeah, my out, output for that is like definitely do some team selling, get your VPs, your CROs involved um, and make sure that you've got really good account mapping um, from a CS perspective and account management perspective. Amazing. Tom, have you got anything to add? Um, no, I mean, uh, I'm sort of... I've I'd want to put a big emphasis on the team selling aspect. Like I'm a really big fan of it and a huge advocate. And uh, I guess um, when the question was asked about um, sort of cross sell and upsell, um, it reminded me of a, a specific example. And again, it's, it, it's snowflake. They're, they're a great example of, uh, of success is um, the cross sell slash upsell slash, let's say expansion piece was actually almost baked into the product from an angle of if you found a specific customer that was the ideal profile, we used to call it the build use case. And what that would do is essentially it, the principle was anyone, uh, any company that grows and utilizes data within their product, and that obviously causes Snowflake to be pulled from, means Snowflake's credits are used. And essentially, it means the more people are using their platform, the more will pull from the under uh, the underneath layer. Sorry, the big data layer. So. As that company grew and they grew more customers, their spend naturally increased. And of course, as they were gaining more customers, 
their revenue increased. And so it, it just reminded me of that in a sense of if you absolutely nail it and you have a product like that, that's such a, I guess, an integral part of their data stack, right? You couldn't rip that out safely without messing up so many different workloads. Um, it can almost embed your expansion piece because it becomes an absolute relied upon tool but at the same time, it's used every time something happens that benefits the business in terms of revenue. So it absolutely has to be there. And in a way, it pays for itself is the kind of sort of uh, way I used to see these build use cases. And it was a perfect ideal customer base to go for. So sometimes you you can have it where it literally the scale is, is almost built in from day one if you pick the ideal customer. Well, it's it's really interesting you mentioned that because there's um a philosophy there are a couple different philosophies for growth and the two ones you see a lot really commonly today are product led growth which is exactly what you described, get the product in there make it sticky it will grow naturally just as more and more people use it within that company it becomes embedded you can't tear it out it becomes indispensable, customer led growth is a little bit trickier when you don't have a product that's that works like that. It has to be customer led yeah. growth where it's all about making sure that their experience and the process and their time to impact is as short as possible. So that's where if you can get that kind of from initial engagement to impact as quick as possible, then they're more likely to go back and more likely to add on more seats or do more, you know, re up, sign up again, do more things there. So it's about making sure, you know, from leaders that you've got the right strategy in place and you're coherent about it. You're consistent about it. So if there are leaders on here, it's like, if you don't understand which side of that spectrum you're on, go take a look at that first, because you can't scale if you don't know how you're going to do it and kind of what the philosophy is behind it. Um, there's a lot of really interesting, um, tons and tons of stuff on there, kind of about all those different things. So as a sales rep, it's better, even if you're not a sales leader, to start familiarizing yourself with these terms so you can understand kind of how what you're doing fits into the bigger picture whether or not you want to go into leadership. Because then all of a sudden, some of the directions and stuff that leadership's giving you makes a little more sense. If you're like, oh, that's why we're doing this really small deal initially. Because I really want to go get 500 seats, but why are they telling me to give them 50? Because it's project-led growth. We want to start doing it this way. So it's understanding kind of all these different tools in the toolkit and how they're being deployed and making sure you're deploying the right ones at the right time. Amazing. Um, yeah, hopefully, Marek, that answers your question. Thank you so much for your question. And yeah, just keep the questions coming in. We'll aim to answer them throughout. Um, I just want to, let's let's go back to this idea of layoffs for a second. Um, obviously, reps right now, it, layoffs is, it's like the nightmare word that they're all hearing. As a, From a sales leadership perspective, uh, you know, how can leaders reassure their reps during this tough time? Because obviously, them, from their perspective, it must be very tricky any words of advice on what leaders can be doing to make sure that their reps are not stressing out too much during this time? Um, who, whoever wants to chime in first, it's just an interesting topic, I guess, about layoffs. Yeah, I'm happy to take this one initially. So I think, like for me, I'm very, very process-led in the way that we kind of do ourselves, like sales in general, like it follows like a set a set flow. Um, and I think one of the key things now is like detaching a little bit away from the outcome um so when you are when you are praising your reps it's really really important that you focus on like those int intermittent steps um and I, I got some really really good advice from one a mentor that i have adam adam liebman he was saying that during uh the previous economic crash when he was managing they changed their commission structure so that they were actually rewarding like on proposals going out on people going through a proof of concept so what it does it really gives quick wins to sales um, much earlier on in the process and keeps the motivation much, much higher. Because for me, I, I'm not going to get annoyed at a rep if they're following the process that we've laid out. And it might be harder now and the numbers might be a little bit a little bit lower in terms of the output that they're getting. But if the process is consistent, like I know that we'll get output at the end, right? And that might mean the reps having to do an extra 20% work, right? Or something along those lines to try and make that, that shortfall. But like process is key for me. Um, so make sure the team... Make sure you've got a process outlined to the team with very clear expectations as to what they need to deliver. And then you you praise the team when they actually do that stuff. I think that's that's the most important thing. And then also as well, like this comes from the top, right, as well, which is just like direction of the business. Like what are we working towards? Like having very transparent conversations with the team, like not glossing over stuff. Um, it's communications key in, in times like this. So I think they're probably my two key takeaways. Tom, Ashley? Anything to add? Yeah, com completely on board with um, 
with what John said. I mean, especially in in terms of the um, reminding the the reps and reassuring them and having time for them. Um, a lot of it, I think, is just being present. Um, and that's not in a sense of the, the product being present, obviously the pipeline, that's a, a, a separate thing, but being present for the actual team in terms of what they need and following up on things and even just being, I guess, that emotional shoulder to, uh, to lean on because, you know, times are tough. Like if you cast back to when, when I was in IC and by, way back when I was an SDR, you know, you do have a sort of Damocles above your head in a lot of sense. And, and it's a case of making sure that that's, you know, you've, you've set realistic expectation um, and you're also supporting them through that outlining that it is a process. You know, sometimes it will be a roller coaster ride. Everyone, you know, says it on LinkedIn. You hear it. It's a cliche, right, to say sales is a roller coaster, but it, it's absolutely true. You know, sometimes you'll have even the most confident reps will come to you and say, you know, hey, look, I haven't hit target for a couple of months. Like, am I am I in any danger? All they need is that reassurance of, well, actually, no, because your activity is high. You've built a great amount of pipeline. That means the presence of our product is being pushed out there. And that means you're building the pipeline for Q2 next year, let's say. Sales is a long game in enterprise. I'm probably spe talking specifically from that angle, I guess, but um, it's and a long game. Right stuff. It really, it it really. It, I have seen this repeatedly. Same thing. If the activity's there, you do get it back. I call it karma. Uh, it's a. I, I think don't pretend to be um, touching any of the religious implications of the word, but it really is what you put in, you will get back out. Probably so, not when you want it, which would be like right now in my paycheck, but you will get it there and. The, Honestly, the story I tell people all the time is I was um, covering when I was an SDR, I was covering New York and Long Island, specifically during uh, Hurricane Superstorm Sandy. My territory literally went underwater for two months. Like, I'm not going to call people and be like, hi, let's talk about your network security. I mean, I had to, but like my calls were, hi, are you and your family OK? No. All right. No problem. You focus on them. I'll call you back in a couple months. So that was that happened early November, I believe, because it was right after Halloween. Uh, Q2, exactly to your point, Thomas, Q2, the year after that, was my biggest, I mean, I broke all sorts of company records for meetings, but because people were coming back to me saying, hey, thanks for being respectful, ready to talk now, what does your schedule look like? So like the first two weeks of that month, I remember it was weird, I booked 80% of my meetings off of replies, my call numbers dropped precipitously, my boss got scared. But then so I was booking instead of one meeting a day, three to four a day for like two weeks, it was insane. But yeah. it's that karma. So the activity being high, you might not see it now, but you will see it eventually. It's also I tell reps a lot, it's a it's a CYA or a cover your mm -hmm -hmm. because while there is last in first out more than anything else, People are, companies will keep the people who are showing that they're working. Show you're doing the work. You're giving yourself a lot of insurance. The other side of that, though, I think it's important for leaders to understand is you have to call out the anxiety. So having a meeting and using transparency and kind of some blunt conversation to diffuse a lot of tension. Hi, I understand your concern because of the global economy. Let's walk through as much of our company numbers as I'm able to share with you. I'll tell you everything I can. And if you have questions, ask if I can answer, I will. Understanding that some things I can't reveal because trade secrets or whatever else. But whatever I can tell you, I will. And I'm doing that to reduce that anxiety. And should things change, I will tell you the moment they can. In the meantime, I ask that you trust me and keep your heads down and keep doing your job. And if you keep doing that, I will do everything I can to protect all of you. The other side of that though is, I think a lot of, I think leaders have to accept, if your reps are anxious about a layoff, it's not because of the global economy, it's probably because of how you've treated in the past 18 months. If you have a history for letting people go after one month, one quarter, of bad performance, of course, everyone on your team is going to be nervous. They're going to have a bad quarter because of the economy, not because of anything they did. So there's also, I think, the cultural component that if you've got that culture right now, there's not a lot you can do right now that will fix it. You can just be aware of it and fix it for next time. So making sure you do the transparency, but also understanding like you have to take ownership for if your team is terrified of you, they probably have a reason to because of your behavior. And at some point you have to own that. Yeah, honestly, just on Ashley's point, it's such a such a good point. Like, look at your top sellers in the organization that you've got, like your account executives. Like, if they go through one bad quarter, absolutely, you should not be putting them on the pip or pushing them out of the business, right? Like, and you you see it time and time again. Managers doing stuff like this, right? Like, it's 
these people ramp time to get a for me, it's six to nine right. months to ramp someone. Come on. One yeah. quarter does not mean you're literally taking money out of your own pocket. This drives me nuts. Yeah. And I think sales leadership have a major role in uh, play in this as well. Like you should be having conversations with your finance team, like try and get some concessions like up front and be like, if 50% of the team miss their number, like that is not down to individual rep performance. That's due, that's due to quotas being too high. Um, and what, what me, what, Obviously, you don't say this to the reps, right? Because they want to be performing 100% during the quarter. But in the event that it comes to the end of the quarter and they miss 50% miss the number, how are we actually going to compensate them? And how are we actually going to make sure that we retain them going into next year when things bounce back? So, yeah, I think we need to have those conversations. The other thing I'd like to say as well is that a lot of onus is always put on the reps, right? Like, it's, it's really down to the organization as well, right? Like, how are you as a sales leadership team making sure that you're giving them the right accounts to go after during a recession? Like... I'm sure there's many software companies that sell software companies and they've got a very, very wide term, right? And they stick to what they know rather than diversify into areas that are a bit more stable in the market at the moment. Um, and if, you, if you're not putting the infrastructure in place for the reps, how can you expect them to perform um, and have the insight? Like all of this kind of stuff should be taken by leadership at the top. That's great. Um, let's take a little uh, deep dive into culture for a second, um, because you know Ashley brought it up, and it's so it's so true. Um, you know, Tom, from your experience right now managing an enterprise team, for example, um, what are you doing to make sure that the reps are feeling motivated during this time? Um, are there any like specific like training exercises that you're running? Like, how is this? How is it looking? And um, have you got any advice for sales leaders that can do the same? Yeah, no, um, great question. So I would definitely say I, I'm I'm one of those people who's quite sort of high touch in terms of, uh, you know, my team. And so they, they probably hear from me a little bit too much, but not in a sense of me pestering them about anything relating to work. It's literally a check in to see how they're doing. And although, again, that sounds, you know, awfully sort of cliche and basic it actually does make a world of difference. You know, it, it sort of, I guess, breaks that that ice, especially given I'm still relatively new here, right? You know, it's my fourth month. And so, you know, I had to come in with a massive degree of respect for these guys because obviously they know the product inside and out. They're our most sort of senior tenured sellers. Um, you know, I had to come in and, and, and be in a sense of, yeah, you know what, I care about more than just a sense of this is a job. I care about your well-being. I care about how you're actually doing outside of work. You know, if you need to, uh, you know, speak to me about certain things that, again, don't involve uh, necessarily your sales cycle, you know, I can be that figure who is approachable in that way. And so, yeah, I would definitely say, um, you know, in, in terms of that culture element, Cognizant definitely gives that off a lot. Even just the subtle things of cross-team congratulating for deals and things like that. I absolutely love that. You know, the SDRs have their own dedicated ch uh, channel on Slack. I know most organizations do this, but, um, you know, to celebrate their wins, to celebrate their meetings booked, meetings attended, you know, all that sort of stuff is is just so uplifting. Um, and and I, it's something I really want to continue, you know, something I put into place recently. And, uh, and uh, you know, at first, not everyone was happy about it because everyone worked in different ways, but um, I put in pod alignment sessions for my team and what i found is fingers crossed you know the uh, sdr managers agree with me the meeting volumes and, and quality has gone has gone up for, per rep because i think there was just a little bit of a not a breaking communication but there were a few things that weren't going uh you know as as planned in terms of the communication element between those guys you know in terms of you know how they were just working and they were doing the job they were doing extremely well but i think it was just that closer alignment piece and the reason i brought that up is because it was essentially a a human moment it was a sense of you know let's connect with each other on a bit of a closer level you know okay let's understand each other how we communicate with each other face to face and that translates across to that relationship building piece so um you know i was definitely a big fan of those alignment sessions i think and that's part of that you know that cultural framework That's great. John, Ashley, have you got anything to add um, to that? Oh, my sound works. I was going to say, um, like, one of the key things that I've seen is just making sure. Is that, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah I think it's going to blow it. Um, one of the key things I was going to say is just, like, make the team understand how their quota is achievable and, like, lay it out in, like, very, very simple terms. Like, that's probably the key thing in this this climate is, like, it's all well and good like plucking a number out of the air but how is that number actually achievable and get the team to buy into that 
And if they can understand the metrics that like lead to that number and that that figure, they can backtrack into that as well. So I think motivation from apart from what Tom's talked about, which is like the transparency and communication, is like get them to understand like what the expectations are and how that's achievable. That's probably one of the most important things. Um, yeah. I would say. yeah. I'll I'll kind of take another step beyond that. Kind of the the third level down from that, I think, is anytime when you know you're heading into a a slower season, a slower economy, something like that. As leaders, that's your time to double down on training and fundamentals. That's the time to start focusing on, like, I, I hate to always use sports analogies. I come from the world of uh, not, well, it, it was very, very competitive, but music. Um, and it's the same thing. Like, if you know you've got a crazy hard piece, do you go through and you drill those specific sections ad nauseum until you kind of can't mess them up. And you do that in a safe environment. A slow economy is a great time to be focusing on those fundamentals, to get that volume in, to make sure you're really locking stuff in. It's a great time to get experimental, to try some new things. I know we talked about, you know, hey, it's, oh, we just need to focus on this one ICP. Well, okay, we can keep 80% on there, but let's take 20% of the team and start trying to break some new markets, see what we think might have some better opportunities. Not because it doesn't matter as much, but because now is exactly the time you can throw everyone and do everything right and things can still go wrong. So you need that experimentation to really keep things going. And that can get everyone excited. Um, that can keep people engaged. It keeps their brains thinking. They're either focused on, okay, I need to make sure I really focus on getting my demo skills right. I'm going to really focus on getting this right. I'm going to really focus on getting that right. Or if you've got someone who's really, really freaking good, Give them carte blanche. I want you to come up with the craziest email you can ever come up with. Like I want like, like no rules. I want you to go come up with something completely original and new. You know, take the day, go whatever you want to do, but come up with something absolutely original and let's see what we can do. Um, it's another great way. Again, it's focusing on learning development. It's keeping people's brains working, not just towards, okay, this is achievable, but also let's get these other, you know, kind of the right brain, left brain side going on both ways. Um, is another huge part, I think, of culture and stuff like that. And that same thing goes with um, mentorship. So when you've got someone who's normally killing their numbers and they're struggling, get them paired with someone who is newer and have them focus on, okay, how can you help this? Or how can we get some mentorship going in here? It helps on a lot of different levels. It reduces your leadership band. It helps improve your leadership bandwidth, but it also gives those newer reps some extra support from someone who's been around the block a few times, maybe has been through a recession before and says, yeah, I know it's crazy. It's fine. I've been through this. And then the newer rep doesn't fly off the handle as quickly. So also leaning into mentorship programs during especially slower times can be really, really helpful. That's great. It was kind of, yeah, links to one of our questions, actually, which is, you know, is it all doom and gloom during this time? And yeah, like you just said, um, identifying areas for return on investment. Um, John, Tom, have you got anything to add in terms of other, you know, wins that can come out of the recession right now for outbound teams? It's much harder to win business now. I think that's probably the key thing. And when there, when times are tough, like there's refinement that takes place and you're going to get much, much stronger like process improvements. So like one example that we've got is like, I'm sure this is evident from everyone listening, like finance and like kind of C-suite are getting involved in decisions that they never would have got involved in before. Right? And one result of like the recent stuff that we've seen is like we've made like a big, big case now in terms of like working on our ROI structure and like having proposal decks that we actually formalize. So I think I think the without the current climate, we probably wouldn't have done that stuff, right? Um, so I think coming out of this, we're going to be much much stronger sellers. We understand like a much better regimented process. We know how to tie that to company objectives and actually get an ROI on the back of it. Whereas before, we weren't necessarily doing that, right? So I think it really goes back to kind of Ashley's point, right? Is now's the time for improvement and thinking outside the box and doing stuff a little bit a little bit unique to try and win the business. Um, and now it's time to really test that, test that stuff. So yeah, I, I fully agree with Ashley's point. It's a really, really good point. Mm -hmm. Tom, have you got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, just to, to, to reinforce, I mean, um, the, uh, the sort of experimentation, um, you know, sort of, uh, period, you know, during, uh, economic sort of downturn is, um, you know, it's, it's quite exciting for me, or it was when I was an IC because it, it almost sort of cut through the doom and gloom or cut through the noise of, you know, we're in a tough spot, selling's really difficult, et cetera. You can, 
you can arguably try and pin the blame on a lot of different things as an IC, but in the end, the the reps who really, you know, sort of re-engage, re-approach, try new things are the ones that, you know, really sort of grasp, you know, at least the decent numbers, you know, as, as good as they can be uh, per expectation within this climate. Um, you know, using uh, outreach sequences and things like that, using some of the wildest sequences you can within reason. Um, you know, it was a really good time to do that when things were slow, exactly like Ashley said. You know, it was a great time to experiment, see if that works if it does then not only does it build your pipeline you know for q2 q3 next year you also now have a new piece of process that can use going forward because the the propensity to spend uh you know from the response you get from that clearly was 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 up because it succeeded in you know such a a dingy climate essentially so yeah completely agree it's kind of funny, Meg. You you mentioned this. I'm curious if anyone in the in the chat or any of our any of our, our listeners had the same thing. Um, I'm someone who I don't know what it is about my personality. I am calmer and more focused when things are hard than when things are good. When things are good, I am a panicky mess. I don't know what it is. I the only way like I've I've kind of made sense of it over the years is when things are good. I've got this kind of of like I have to get everything I can while it's go while it's good because it's going to go away and I don't want to feel like I missed anything. Whereas when things are a little bit slower, I take my time. I've got my lists. I focus on the basics. Everything comes through and I'm super calm. Like I, I remember when I was in IC, it pissed off a few people on the floor because like you know I knock I, back in the days when you had to manually dial, I'd knock out 120 dials in six hours and sit around for two hours and build my list for the next day. And all my colleagues are like, Oh my gosh, you did 120 dials and you didn't get any meetings. Aren't you panicked? I'm like, Nope. Cause I just see any of you do 120 dials and I'm building a list for tomorrow. I'm going to get three tomorrow. Like I just knew I was putting the work and so it would come eventually. And so I just was calmer. <laughs> Whereas, you know, when things were good, I'd get two, three meetings in a day and my colleagues be like, yeah, go home, take the rest of the day. I'm like, no, I've got to get two more because they're not going to get any meetings for the next three days. Like, it's kind of an inverse thing. I don't think I'm the only one, but I know there's a few other people that have, I've met over the years that are kind of like that too. So, except there are different personalities on our team as well. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about this. John, Tom, are you, do you agree? Do you, have you kind of identified that? Uh, really quick, just on the point of like doom and gloom, I think that's a really important note. Like talking like late stage pipeline, like I think sellers just need to have a little bit more concessions um, in today's environment. And that's like know what your concessions are and make sure that you have a little bit of flexibility with with buyers. Right, there's a lot of buyers that do want to still purchase, but they have got some kind of restraints. Right, and they're very very risk averse. Right, so how do you limit how do you limit that risk that they've got? Um, so it might be. Uh, starting with a smaller POC, right? And getting tangible metrics in terms of how you roll into that bigger contract. Like don't necessarily try and get the full whack. It's great if you can get the full whack in your business today. Mm -hmm. um, but understand that delayed, that kind of delay period is probably gonna take a little bit of time. Um, so I think that's probably one of the key things I'll say. Like it might be not doom and gloom. You just need to start a little bit smaller and have a little bit more concessions. Um, and that could really work. But well, and understand uh, how they're defining risk. That's something I think a lot of sellers struggle with. It's like, oh, well, I'm giving you a money back guarantee or I'm giving you this. Why won't you? Because that doesn't necessarily match how their finance team, how their CEO is thinking about risk. So it's making sure you take the time to ask those questions, especially in enterprise. I mean, Thomas, I feel like this is like enterprise 101 is you go in, it's assume nothing. Everything has to be defined by the client and it's way too easy to go in and think, oh, look at my ROI calculator. Nah, you got to basically help them build their own using yeah. their definitions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, building that business case and 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 part of building that business case is, you know, again probing them for the answers that you need. And those answers are, you know, uh, very volumetric. Uh, they come from a lot of different angles, a lot of different perspectives. You know, multi-threading is, uh, you know, a, a term that's often overused, and but I, I'm glad it is because it really summarizes like all the different angles you have to go to. And you're exactly right. You know, like what is risk to certain areas, and and so. I guess when you encounter, you know, more difficult, uh, you know, sort of stakeholders, let's say within procurement, right, they're going to be very risk adverse because it's their neck on the line. But if you've produced a good enough business case 
an ROI they can at least relate to. And then maybe, you know, you've pulled on some personal levers, you know, some personal drivers from them. So, okay, yeah, let's, you know, let's build into the business case that you haggled us down a little bit. You know, it can be about appearances, you know, so oh, so many re- different factors. Moment procurement gets in there. Like this is like my number one trip. If you are in a deal and procurement gets involved, ask procurement how they're paid. Ask them how they're paid. How are you going to make money on this? Do you have to negotiate percent off total deal off? Or are you off percent monthly? Okay, great. Thanks for telling me that. Here's what I propose. Just be blunt and ask them. They might get a little cagey. It doesn't happen often. They get a little freaked out. But it shows you know what the game is. It shows you're not going to get pushed around. And more than anything else, more often than not, they say, oh, I just have to go. I'm you know compensated off of percent saved off the total, off the TCV. Great. Okay. So let's take a look at these metrics so that you can get your TCV, but I'm still not, you know, giving you a Lamborghini for the price of a Corolla. And let's figure this out. Yeah. Kind of figuring that out. That's like my favorite procurement hack is just ask them, how are they compensated? And if it's MRR, okay, great. Then let's look at maybe we can play with term. We can play with payment terms. We can pay with all these other things. None of which involves actually lowering the amount of money you're collecting. But if you don't know how they're paid, then what they're doing is never going to make sense. And you're basically negotiating with one arm tied behind your back. So it doesn't matter how good your champion is. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Great stuff. Um, I just want to quickly flag something that um, Marek has actually said in the comments. Um, What we actually did in March 2020 when COVID hit and locked with lockdowns, et cetera, was to focus internally. So built internal learning programs, more trainings re-engineering the website, SEO optimization, work on a solid marketing plan, et cetera. Um, yeah, uh, to continue to engage with our audience and remain top of mind. Um, I just wanted to kind of flag that up because I think that's kind of links really well into what we what you guys were chatting about. Um, any thoughts on that um, at all, just before we move on? Yeah, it's, I think that's a great point. And it, it literally reminds me of something that John mentioned to me before this call and that he had a chat with our CEO and it was a sense of um, even during, you know, the the sort of tougher climates, even if deals aren't closing as quick as you want them to, because you're building that pipeline and that presence in the market, that's so much more powerful uh, than than obviously just relying on a small amount of deals coming in just sort of facing it just keep building the pipeline up and so when it comes to obviously relating that to uh yeah internal growth you know lean on the people that are obviously have, have brought you to the place you are right now you know obviously make sure they're empowered make sure they have everything they need and yeah it might mean you have to spend a, a bit of money in you know a tough climate but heck it's going to pay you back miles and miles in into the future like in, in terms of not only pipeline but employee satisfaction um so I, I think it's a really really good point really really glad that was brought up yeah i'll say it. one thing on that as well which is great is like the crossover between inbound and outbound mm-hmm. like every view everyone views them so separately right like i think this is just a brilliant example of how outbound delayed then comes inbound and it's all about that customer journey mm-hmm. and the yeah. benefit of that as well is from an outbound perspective if you're putting out such good messaging at the moment you're going after the right fit accounts that means when things do turn the inbounds that are coming in are going to be brilliant accounts that have a very high net dollar retention that are going to be brilliant brilliant customers right so um like the fruits of labor like doing the work now will come in effect like much much later and i've even as an ic right i've seen this when when i first started cognizant as an sdr i got i think i got an email once from someone like two two years prior to that saying now's the right time right so if you put the work in when time's a little bit quiet people aren't necessarily having loads of outbound meetings but your top of mind like it will 100 percent come back in return later two things i want to add on to that i think that are really important to call out one is um do not shy away from taking meetings with people who tell you they cannot buy right now because budget's frozen and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like you can start the sales process while the budget's frozen, get everything ready to go in the moment the budget's unfrozen, it's a quick deal. So one, like I, I've worked with some companies that I've recommended them dropping kind of the B from the BANT criteria for the next six months. Take all the meetings you can, talk to everybody you can, make sure you're not leaving anything on the table. So that's a really important thing. But two, I think something uh, in, in America, thing that I think is really important. And I've seen a couple of companies do that's really helpful in a down economy. Double down on case studies. Go go to all your best clients, get them to do a case study. One, it reinforces to them the ROI that you deliver to them. So they're more likely to actually stay, even if you have to anonymize it. Two, it arms your team with a 
ton of amazing stories they can start using immediately to get more people involved. And when the economy picks up again and no one's got time to do this stuff, you're not constantly beating down people's doors trying to do this stuff. So like now is a great time. The next six months is going to be an incredible time to get your client's attention. Do those case studies, reinforce your value to your best clients and kind of go from there. So I'd say like, I take your top 10% of clients and try and get, if you haven't done a case study with them yet, get a case study done, even if you have to anonymize it to be like a SaaS company in San Francisco or in California, that's still incredibly valuable, even if you can't get their exact name. So Ashley made such a good point there around like the, um, like the metric that you're measuring the team on, um, like especially today, right? Like it's much better to have your account executive taking it earlier in the sales process and having an extremely strict qualification where people aren't getting through to the AEs. Um, and we we done that 100%. We've done exactly what Ashley said, right? We remove budget from um, the criteria and all we have is Ant. And we bring the AEs in much earlier to the into the sales process. So they have more conversations. Um, so it's a superb, super point. Like 100% do that. I'd say about, I'd say honestly, most of the companies I work with now are at the point where they're just an Ann. They don't even have timeline in there because they know timeline's so fluid. Mm. It's just the moment the budget opens up, they'll talk to you about it. So they just go for authority and need and go from there. And that's, Better for enterprise, less better if you're dealing with, say, uh, your ACV is sub 20K, you're probably still going to want T in there yeah. um, because your deal cycle is just going to be slower. But especially if you're looking at something that's a six figure deal, you're probably like you might want to even think about potentially looking, okay, well, how how are we defining timeline and stuff like that? So it all, it all speaks to kind of this theme of the day, I feel like, is like the iteration of every single step in the process. There's a guy, um, and I, I love him on a British program, I'm about to bring this guy up, whose name's uh, Dave Brails. Uh, Brailsworth, Brailsford, Brails, Brailsford. He basically completely revolutionized uh, British cycling by going for incremental grains, incremental gains. So it's this idea that if you improve everything 1% and not just the obvious stuff like SAL to SQL, MQL to SAL percentages, you know, SQL to close, not just that, but like how, like, can you get 1% more people to pick up the phones? Can you get 1% better data? Can you get 1% more time in seat out of your reps? Can you get 1% you know, better mental health and positivity on your team? All of those things added up really make a big difference. And now's the time to go and try and experiment with this stuff to get those incremental gains. You'll know that A, you're getting everything you can out of this economy. And then B, one thing that things actually turn around, then you really have a rocket ship. Then you're really, uh, as we say, sometimes in, in the States, cooking with gas. So. Like one thing that I'm not sure if I'll get in trouble for this was talking about our kind of marketing tactics, but like one thing we're really looking at the moment is um, like the customer journey when, when people come inbound and mm. one of the incremental gains that we've done, which is super, super good is we've allowed people from the website to directly book in with account executives when we've got that as a named account. So we're completely mm. removing the friction of going through an SDR and being qualified and then going to the AE. If people are in market at the moment looking to buy coming inbound like absolutely get them in front of like your your sales team um rather than having to go through like multiple layers of qualification etc so assuming your aes are properly trained and will actually follow sure. these things up i worked at companies where we did that and was back with the sdrs within 60 days because the aes were not consistent on that follow-up yeah so as long as you're trained yes <laughs> Yeah, this, I think this is the thing as well. Like, it's a very select group in terms of what we've done. We've done it for like our named accounts, but oh, perfect. The, yeah, the, the propensity of people that are like, the, the likelihood of them to buy when they're a named account coming inbound, like, they don't need to go through five or six journeys. And that that came from iteration, right? During this current, current time and alignment with other departments as well. Like, sales had to agree to kind of this marketing. This marketing idea right but um cross, cross departmental agreement was like in place and it's, it's working really really well at the moment mm -hmm. this is great thank you so much guys um yeah i think this is all around like optimizing and, and finding efficiencies in your team um this you know are there any others that we haven't identified yet what about tech stack is this a good opportunity to refine your tech stack um you know are there any any advice for finding other efficiencies in your process? Um, you know, anything that we haven't already spoken about? Yes, I, there's there's one I definitely touch upon just from my sort of previous work. And uh, I'm not trying to plug any previous companies, but they were very, very good in terms of back end data. And so 
I'd say right now, the absolute importance of reporting and reliance on decision making from data is absolutely paramount. So when you mentioned tech stack straight away, it came to the front of mind, not only your back end tech stacks, obviously your storage layer, obviously um, transformational piece and, and obviously your ingestion. Um, it's a sense of the front end too. So obviously things like your CRM, if does that need refining? Is it easy to obviously integrate your uh, other sort of SaaS solutions into that? And obviously Cognizant falls into that piece very well because it's a, a sales business intelligence tool essentially. But the more sort of data you have consolidated into one place is always going to be, uh, you know, it's always going to lead to a sort of stronger weathering of the storm, so to speak. And so a big challenge I used to see when when I worked, you know, specifically in data was uh, bringing together uh, data silos. So obviously having, you know, mm -hmm. sort of uh, nested pots of data in multiple different places, none of it was really being used in the right way or it was being used in uh, a way where it was restricted to certain users, not accessible by others, which could obviously help their sales cycle or help their marketing activity, et cetera. Consolidating that all together in one solution is not only extremely useful, but it means everyone can sing off the same hymn sheet. You know, if you're if you have a culture that where where people within your organization can truly self serve with data, build their own reports, build their own metrics, etc., you, you're honestly going to be, as Ashley said, cooking with gas. I love that phrase because it's absolutely the way to go. You know, with a, a data driven culture. So. If you're refining your tech stack, I would definitely look into, you know, your your data efficiency, really, from from that angle. I, I, I got to second that because the it's funny. We say tech stack and everyone thinks dialers and sales engagement and all the data. Start with your data. Are you actually getting good names, good emails, good phones, period? If you don't have that, you literally aren't putting gas in the car. If we're going to stick with the gas analogy. Like you can have the fanciest car in the world, but if you don't have gas in it, I don't care if it's diesel, petrol, natural gas, electricity, whatever, it ain't going anywhere. And that's something that I think a lot of sales leaders overlook um, painfully into their own detriment. They think, oh, look, look at us. We've got this perfect, great tech stack and no leads going into it. Yeah. Absolutely useless. So now's the time I'd say, if you're going to look at your tech stack, yes, do start with data. Yeah. yeah. I think one thing is just looking at our tech stack as well. Like we, We're probably in that's a little bit guilty is there's been so much innovation in a lot of these tech companies over the last like 12 months 18 months and they're kind of all converging into the same kind of space right forecasting sequencing call recording i'm sure if you look at the technology you've got you've probably got mass crossover between a couple of them as well um so it might be a good time during this like down period a little bit so maybe go back get revisit see what developments have taken place and kind of see where there is crossover because there's probably a lot that you could you can save on the back end as well on usage. I think this is another one that no one really measures, right? Like, is your team actually using <laughs> the technology that you've got? Like, I'm sure people on the call today, like if you've got a centralized dashboard that shows all the usage across all the technologies for all your reps, then you're in an amazing spot. Even I don't have that. Like, I don't I don't know what my team's using daily, right? Um, so go back to the basics, start looking at all that stuff and then refine your tech stack based on that. Just subtle thing here. If you're struggling with this, please hit up ashleyearly.com on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever else. I do what I call technology audits for companies all the time to kind of address exactly that question, potentially build dashboards, stuff like that. It's it's a tricky thing to do. Um, and a lot of it usually comes down to how, I'd say more often than I go into company say your tech stack's fine. You just haven't trained your team properly on it or you haven't set it up to be properly user friendly enough. So it's like, oh, look, we've got all these different tools. Yeah, and none of them actually talk to each other because you haven't set up the APIs right. And none of them actually, so they're ending up actually doing more work transcribing everything between all the different data silos, Thomas, to your point. So it's like, great, that's great that, you know, outreach and Salesforce talk to each other. But if they're having to go and pull the alerts manually from Zoom Info or whatever else, that's absolutely useless. Or yeah. whatever other data intelligence you're dealing with. Or, oh, we can't do this because security or whatever else. So like it can be tricky. And then it's also again, that level of like, okay, well, oh, our BDRs are great at using this stuff, but our enterprise AE suck at it. Why? <laughs> Let's take a look at kind of that stuff too. So it's like, before you go buying new tools, look at what you've got. Are people actually using it? Are they set up properly? And then, okay, what else might we need? And now is a great time to buy sales tech. That was a great time to buy sales tech. It is absolutely a buyer's market. So if you're actually in the market, you can get some very aggressive deals from your sales reps right now. Hate to say it on this call, but it's kind of <laughs> true. I don't know if you um, agree with this, Ashley, but like, I, I guess there's 
in in some organizations that are new to let's say adopting the cloud and and that you know side of data um there's been a bit of a a stigma slash fear of the back end data the big data you know because that's for the sql developers right that's for the data scientists you know the machine machine learning staff things like that in actual fact if you have your big data or your back end data plugged into something visualization like tableau literally anyone can start using that and so if you become truly you know self served in data it empowers everybody you know it really really does and obviously you know you, you wouldn't want anyone being able to edit the back end data right you'd need to put specific user access on it but at the same time just for viewing it from a visualization perspective and having a nice you know pie chart in front of you that says okay we can go in this direction safely there's nothing better you know it's based on pure fact so yeah, I, I found overcoming that stigma of, of, of back-end data and realizing that actually it can be used by anybody is a real step forward, I think, for, for cloud adoption, at least, anyway. Yeah, I, I call it kind of old old school sales, new school sales. Old school sales is, you know, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Wolf of Wall Street, pound the phones, don't take no for an answer. New school sales is let's go on Tableau and see what markets haven't peaked yet, but are getting some, we're getting some additional traction yeah. in this month and going and getting smarter in there. And there's there's a great question actually in the chat I saw from Thomas Bull, uh, Bullman, how can a high performing AES dare stand up in their company aside from revenue and pipeline? Doing stuff like that, like asking for, hey, I wanna go do some research. I wanna go find and dig these things out. Taking a little bit of initiative. Hey, I've noticed that I'm getting more of this objection on a cold um, on my calls these days. Here's how I'm answering it. Does anyone else have any better answers? It's speaking up about trends and going and looking for trends. Even you don't have to be a data analyst, you don't have to be an operations specialist, but just flagging these things shows a higher level of thinking that literally, I cannot tell you as an after a decade as an overstrapped sales leader, I don't have the bandwidth in my brain to do some of this analysis sometimes. So if my rep comes up to me and says, hey, I've been getting a lot of really weird inbounds from Etsy sellers lately. Great, you just gave me a direction to go run in and see if I can get you guys some more leads in that trend or something like that. So speaking up about stuff like that is hugely helpful. And then ideally, I'll even tell you, hey, great, I'm going to get you access to Tableau. Can you go figure this out? Ping me if you have questions. Then you come back to me with a lovely like presentation, a bunch of pie charts. I, I will love you forever and you will be my best friend and I will get you off my team as quick as I humanly possibly can because I want to reward that initiative and that higher level thinking and kind of go through there. So sense there amazing thanks Ashley for addressing that question because I was going to bring that up um Thomas <laughs> teed it up I just followed up I was like oh good perfect we got a few things there <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so we've, we've got a few minutes left uh we've only got two or three minutes left uh I guess just any of our panelists any last minute advice um with the two minutes we have about you know scaling during this recession um you know leading your outbound team during the recession right now any any last minute thoughts I'll, I'll start with one. Um, I don't know if anyone else here is a fan of the book uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but um, it's a really silly sci-fi book and a very silly movie. But um, one of the quotes that a lot of people keep from that book is the phrase, don't panic. And I feel like that's very appropriate for a lot of sales leaders right now is just don't panic. It'll be okay. You will figure it out. I'm not saying, I hate to say it, like I'm not saying you will survive, but panicking does nothing. So the best thing you can do is just don't panic, focus on data, focus on your people. The outcome will be what the outcome will be. And you've got the best chance if you just don't panic. Yeah, hundred percent. I think like key thing for me is just like, take a step back. And uh, now it's time to look back, reflect, see where there are successes in the organization. You're probably still closing deals, what deals are closing and then amplify that out, right? Like, as Ashley said, like don't make any rash decisions, um, lead with data um, and, it will all get better soon, 100%. One Amazing. final thing re yeah, relative okay. to uh, that, that gents question, I believe it was Thomas, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, if you're, I believe it was a high performing rep and in terms of keeping, you know, pipeline going, um, just based on some of the stuff that we've mentioned about, you know, the, the times where it wasn't quite right to buy for a certain prospect or customer and using data, um, you know, maybe run some reports and you can even do it just via Salesforce if you're using it or HubSpot of uh, opportunities that were previously closed lost. And I know that sounds like a really obvious thing to do, but um, just have a peek into the reasons. You know, if it was closed lost and unfortunately, you know, let's say a previous AE 
close lost it because the sales cycle wasn't moving quick enough or it wasn't time to buy and they decided not to keep that opportunity because they wanted to focus on other things, you know, but now might be the time to actually buy from that. And that's a really quick way in for you. Um, the other final thing I would say on that as well is study the macroeconomic climate. So what's really hot in the uptake right now, then look for competitors of those organizations or competitors of organizations you've already onboarded. Um, and again, that can be spotting names in opportunities that were previously on the table. It could be a case of, hey, I've seen you surge on LinkedIn right now. X, Y, and Z has occurred. Um, realize you previously spoke to a colleague of mine. Can we re-engage on this? And and it can be as simple as that, really. It honestly can. So um, we have a, a an AE on... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We've got no. 10 seconds left. No, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, no. Finished. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, well, wait, Tom, you can always reply afterwards. You can put a little follow-up. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Bye. That's a, that's a hard cut. I didn't realise it was... Yeah, that was, that was brutal. <laughs> anyway, cheers, Ashley. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ashley. Of course. Anytime.